Hey, John, I just wanted to thank you for all your help. You've helped me push my photography up to it. Another level, and I just want to say I love your podcast. Thanks a lot. It's Thursday, the 9th of November. This is show number 41, photo walkthrough, tutorial 11, chapter 1. Hello, my name's John Arnold, and I'm coming to you from the northwest of England. It's been a hectic couple of weeks, and it's good to be home. Today we've got a brand new tutorial image which was taken during the Tips from the Top Floor Photography Workshop in September, and we've got a new short composition segment and an assignment. But first, I want to tell you about a telephone conversation I had last night. While I was away in Vegas, I aired our first photo walkthrough review show, and I reviewed Lightroom Beta 4. Before I published that show, I mailed George Jardine to tell him about the review. George is the guy at Adobe who's the Lightroom evangelist guy, and he also produces the Adobe Lightroom podcast. Anyway, George was very gracious about the review, and he offered to have a chat with me on the phone about some of my criticisms. So that's what we did last night. We chatted for about 30 minutes, and George answered a lot of my questions about why things are the way they are in Lightroom, and also what to expect regarding some of the problems I pointed out in my review. My biggest criticism of Lightroom was its inability to import PSD files that have been saved without the maximized compatibility flag. As I said in the review, this is a real biggie for me because I have so many old PSD files and I've never previously had the maximized compatibility thing turned on. Well, the deal is that the maximized compatibility flag basically produces an image preview and saves it in the PSD file. This makes it much easier for programs that can't read the layer data they can instead just read the rolled up preview. Now for Lightroom to read the layers data, they would have to incorporate the PSD reading code from Photoshop CS2. They could do it, but that code is pretty large and they're concerned that doing so would add too much to the size of the Lightroom application. George told me that the intention with Lightroom was originally to make it small and fast and that the program size and memory footprint of the PSD reading code was the problem. I pointed out that right now, small and fast are two words I would definitely not use to describe Lightroom. We generally agreed on that point, but we did discuss some of the things that Adobe are doing to improve the situation, and in the main, I really like what George had to say. For starters, Adobe are working on a beta 5 which will most likely remain internal, but in that version they've changed the way the previews are created. Right now, Lightroom creates full-size previews for every image it imports, which fills up your disk and slows down the program. A lot. But in the new plan, it's only going to build a full-size preview when you zoom into an image using the loop view. That sounds like it'll be much faster and take up far less disk space. And there are also some changes coming with how shoots are organized. Apparently they're going to look a lot more like folders, while still remaining database-driven. That wasn't really nailed down enough for me to tease out any more specifics, though. Anyway, we chatted for a little longer and I made my case inclu for including full PSD import support, and I wasn't totally convinced about the reasons for omitting it, but I did learn a lot about how the Lightroom team are approaching the development, and I gained a real appreciation for what they're trying to achieve. They're really trying to come up with a fresh new way of working with digital raw photographs, and they're trying really hard not to allow their hands to be tied by existing ideas about how things should work. That's an honourable goal, and in many respects I like how they're thinking. I still think it should be tempered by some market awareness of who their potential customers are and what those customers might expect, but it's a pretty interesting big adventure. From our conversation, it's clear that there are some big forces pulling on the Lightroom development team in all different directions, and I'm aware that I'm just another force with my own agenda. George and the team are steering a course through all those forces, and are really focused on getting the best product out that they can for version 1. I'm pretty sure there will be things missing from Release 1 that I believe are important, and I'm equally sure that they'll include some things in Release 1 that I believe are equally important. Once they get over that initial release hurdle, I'm confident that the immediate priorities for the next release will become a lot clearer. For now though, I'd like to thank George for taking the time to talk to me, and let me peek inside the Lightroom tent. It was illuminating and useful, and given how important I believe Lightroom will be to photographers like us, I'll do my best to keep you all informed about how it proceeds.
Last week, I announced at the end of the competition results show that I'd be in London for a Tips from the Top Floor get-together on November the 11th. Well, I will be in London on November the 11th, but unfortunately I got the dates of the get-together wrong. It's actually the 18th, and unfortunately that's the date of my nephew's first birthday party. I'm really sorry folks, but I'm sure you'll agree that family has to come first, and I just can't be there. Okay, let's do today's Composition Mission. Yes, today's Composition Mission is Reduce and Simplify. And while I talk about this, I'm just going to show you some pictures I've picked out from the photo walkthrough group on Flickr that are good examples of reducing and simplifying. A lot of composition techniques focus on where in the frame to place your subjects, but equally important is to consider what subjects you want to include. Like all good techniques, this one applies equally well to photography, painting, graphic design, and almost any other aesthetic endeavor. The essence of reducing and simplifying is to remove anything from the frame that doesn't absolutely need to be there in order to paint the picture you want to show. Remember from our last composition exercise that context is often equally important to your shot, but to really help your viewers see what you want them to see, you need to remove any distracting or unsupporting elements. One way to do that is to move closer to your subject, have it take up a larger portion of your frame. Another way is to use light. Try lighting your main subject brighter than the rest of the shot. Darker elements in the shot will have a reduced importance. You can also reduce and simplify by blurring a distracting background while keeping your subject in sharp focus. Do that by using large apertures on your camera or getting closer to your subject. This is much easier with the larger lenses you find on SLR cameras. Many point-and-shoot cameras have very small lenses, which means very small apertures. To blur out the backgrounds with one of those, you'll need to get very close to your subject. Also consider reducing and simplifying the colors in your shot. Good color relationships can really make a shot work. Eliminating distracting colored elements from your shot can help the viewer to focus on what you want them to see. Most important of all though, whenever you lift your camera up to your eye, you need to make a decision about what you want the viewer of the photograph to see. Pick a small number of subjects, two or three is ideal. Decide on how you want them to interact with each other in the shot, and then find a way to position yourself and your subjects so that they are the main focus of the shot. Reduce and simplify everything else. So that's today's composition mission. And as usual, this is an assignment. Your assignment is, once again, to spend not less than 20 minutes taking 30 pictures. If you want to do this right, then aim to make it exactly 30. I know it seems arbitrary, but having 30 is a great number because it stops you just shooting willy-nilly. It forces you to take care over each shot. And if you take a good shot early on, it also forces you to keep on looking for more shots. You might find something even better. So please, if you're really interested in improving your composition, then do try and do the 30 shot thing. And if you'd like to take part in the assignment, then choose your one best shot out of the 30 and post it to our Flickr assignment group, which is called PW underscore assignments. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. And at the end of today's show, I'll display some of the assignment submissions from our last composition assignment, which was all about the rule of thirds. Okay, let's get started with today's shot. Uh, what I'd like to do today is something a little bit unusual, something I don't normally do, and that's I'm going to show you um, some shots that I d didn't make the final cut. The shot that you're looking at here is the picture that we're going to work on today, but um, this was taken during the Tips on the Top Floor workshop in September, and it was part of one of those 30-shot exercises, just like our um, like our composition composition missions. And... Um, in fact, that was where I got the idea. The idea with this particular shot was um, one day on the on the workshop, Chris told us to, starting from the doorway of his office, take 30 paces in any direction and then stop. And where we ended up was where we had to stay until we'd taken 30 photographs. And so I thought I'd show you some of mine. Uh, that day I took my 70 to 200 mil lens on the 5D, so sort of telephoto but not huge. Um, and as I walked out, obviously I was trying to decide where I was going as I walked, and as I walked I tried to find somewhere with as many subjects around me as I could, and I basically walked around the side of his office to where there's a sort of a square um, where a road ends, a sort of a, a, a cul-de-sac where the end of the road stops, 
Um, and there's some office offices and there's some uh, residential apartments. Um, and it's it's quite a nice active sort of area. There's plenty of people around, uh, although I didn't take too many pictures of people that day. And um, of the 30 shots I took, the one that you can see here is the one that I ended up keeping uh, and using. But uh, I just thought I'd quickly, because it's something I've been talking about in the composition assignments, I thought I'd just show you how my thinking was going that day. So I'm just going to sort of scroll up and down a little bit. And you can see I I did take a few different shots on this same subject. I found this wheelbarrow that was um, it was old and rusty, and it had this sort of faint blue on the side and a, and a sort of a, a rusty orangey colour inside. Um, and I, I was sort of taken with... The, the shapes of the wheel, the spokes, and the thing that, that caught my eye here was the light coming through the spokes, and this is something I brought out more in the final shot. Uh, the light coming through the spokes, you can see the, the sort of the shadows of the radiating spokes there on the side of the, the wheelbarrow, and that, that caught my eye and interested me. So I was trying to get the shape of the wheel, and I was trying to get the light on the side of the wheelbarrow, and I was trying to do a shallow depth of field, and this all comes back to the same um, reducing and simplifying technique that we're talking about in today's composition exercise. So uh, you can see a lot of oh, that was terrible. I don't know what I was thinking there. A lot of what I was thinking that t that day was reducing and simplifying. And I knew when I went out that I was going to try and take as simple a subject as I could and get close in and just try and show some interesting shapes. This was this was Chris who. Uh, being accosted by this chap on a bicycle who was trying to figure out why there were all these people stood still taking lots of photos. There were quite a few of us, and if you look at this shot here, through the flowers there, through the plants, you can see somebody in the background also taking a photograph back towards me. Um, and, uh, you know, here is another example. I'm using uh, shallow depth of field here, nice, nice wide aperture. Um, I don't know what this aperture was on this one, actually. Um, but uh, using a wide aperture on, on a long lens, um, just to throw the background out of focus, got some general people. Chris posing. You can never take a photo of Chris with a normal, reasonable smile. The, the only way to do that is catch him when he's not away. You're taking a photograph. Any time you point a camera at him, he pulls a stupid face. Anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, a couple of interesting. These are these are office buildings that are around the back of Chris's uh, Chris's office building, and I liked the graffiti here. And I was trying to look at. Um, on this particular shot, I had contrast in mind, and I wanted sort of man-made with graffiti, with uh, just the green of the plants and the repeating pattern on the, the ivy there. Um, and I, this is the same sort of concept. I was planning to to crop this off so that I, we had just the um, the basketball hoop and the, the plants at the background. Um, I liked this one. I, I, I love textures. I'm, my eyes always drawn to... Uh, to textures and particularly wooden textures I love so I was quite drawn to this just because of the way the the woodwork uh, you know the way the wood intersected and the the colors and the patterns on the wood and I would probably have had I chosen that one as my final one I probably have spent a load of time bringing out the detail in that texture here's an interesting one this one appealed to me because I saw a wheel in front of a graffitied circle on the door in the background and uh, a nice example of repetition there. I just wish I'd been able to move because I was rooted on this spot. And what I really wanted to do was move around so that I could recompose those two elements and perhaps use this line that goes through the circle at the back as a leading line just to lead, lead the eye from one circle to the other and possibly just get closer to uh, compose out some of these other distracting elements. So, um, I mean, just if I quickly go into the raw converter here. And uh, as I've said before... Um, Unfortunately, this raw converter doesn't go any smaller than uh, 1024 by 768, so you can't quite see all of it, but just as an example of what I had in mind compositionally, maybe something like that, and maybe just move lower and a little more to the right so that the, so that the two had more of a relationship. Um, but you can see what I had in mind there, and, and that's one of the ideas that occurred to me while I was, while I was working on these 30 shots. Is Alan, who's one of the guys that was on the on the thing. Uh, that's, this is not from the 30 shots. This is me eating the world's largest and greatest kebab. Who knew Germany was good for kebabs? Anyway, um, so moving back down. Um, let's see if there's any more here that demonstrate my point. I liked this one. Um, I just wish I could have got rid of some of the 
background up there. This is a good example of needing to reduce and simplify some color. There's an element of red at the top there, and it's darker as well. That doesn't help. That that draws the eye too much. Um, but you can see I was trying to just get a, a big empty foreground, but a negative space there. And that's another compositional technique that I'll come on to in a future show. Um, still don't know what I was thinking with that shot. Anyway, so that was the one I ended up with. Let's see if there's any more texture again. Not greatly composed, though. Quite like that one. Um, needs a lot doing to it, but I, it had a, a foreground and a, sort of a, an interesting Spartan sort of background with just this light a fixture hanging down at the top there. It was kind of unfinished. Um, half a bike. I was actually interested in the repeating railings there and the bike sticking out from between them. It's kind of a repetition thing going on. I was trying to echo the edge of the frame here. This was a very arty-farty idea. I was trying to get the shapes at the edge of this sign that was hanging off something and the shapes of this black portion of the sign here to echo the edge of the frame here, which is kind of an unusual idea. I don't know how, other, how well it works, but that was the idea. Um, and here also, um, using the bike rack on the back of this car, uh, not only to sort of um, frame the shot, but also um, to reflect the bike in the background as well. Unfortunately, I messed up the depth of field there. I had in mind to have the bike slightly out of focus, but, but recognizable as a bike. And as it turns out, I, I overshot and made the depth of field too too shallow, and the bike in the background really isn't identifiable. So um, it was a bit of a shame. Another idea with depth of field there, just wanted to use a leading line right through the middle of the shot, wanted to get as square on it as I could, but unfortunately I couldn't move. So <laughs> I got it as square as I was able. Um, and as you can see, it's not it leans off a little bit to the left, and it's not quite square at the bottom. But I could probably crop and tilt that a little bit just to fix it, but I'm not sure the shot really warrants any time. Um, another just interesting element, I like the lines on the bottom of the boat and a bit of shallow depth of field again. Crisscrossing lines here, that was what I was seeing. I, I had a real thing going on with trying to echo the, sh the frame of the shot. Um, and once again I returned for my final shot back to this wheel, which is I think probably on the day the thing that most caught my eye, so that was why I ended up choosing that particular shot that I did. So um, so there, you've seen all the shots I took during one of my 30, 30 shot um, composition exercises. Um, I hope the little insight into my brain isn't too frightening. Um, let's, let's begin. Um, I'm going to keep it simple today. This show's running a little bit long, so all I'm going to do, you've seen my, my shots, you've seen what I had in mind when I was selecting them. The reason I chose this particular shot in the end was that um, it had a nice balance of the wheel and the light and the texture um, and nothing else. I managed to compose it so that it was nicely simplified with um, nothing else in the shot that, that I didn't really want to be there. I've got a good amount of context. You can see that it's on a sort of a broken, um, not very well paved sort of bit of ground and that adds to the sort of the grit of the whole shot. It just, it's it, this shot for me was totally about texture and rusting and aging and, and just those interesting shapes on that old wheelbarrow. So that was what, what caused me to choose this particular version. It, you know, there's, there is a little bit of shallow depth of field, but it's not massive. And actually, the, the, just the, the placement of the subjects in the shot, I thought, came out best of the ones on, the, on, on, uh, on offer. So let's just manage, to, let's just go and, and do the raw conversion on that. And the way we do that is by pressing Control R, which brings up the raw converter, which, as I've said, is too big for too big for the window. So um, this is actually as it was finished when I finished post processing it. Let's just have a quick look. Um, I've obviously used the auto settings for exposure and shadow sliders here, and I I will have used the auto settings for the brightness and contrast um, and saturation would have been at zero and I've obviously tweaked them and it looks like let's just remember those numbers 59 and 66 so now if there's a quick way to turn on all those auto checkboxes of course you can just click the autos here um, but what uh, the, the, another way of doing it is to press control or command U on your, on your keyboard um, and this gives us 
actually if I just control U and turn everything off this is how the shot looked when it came out of the camera this is the totally raw unprocessed oh, well, let's just put the saturation back to where it should be this is the totally raw unprocessed version and uh, if I press control U to turn on those auto settings you can see that really boosts the contrast quite a lot um, the saturation is now looking overly pronounced um, so I'm just going to drag that saturation down I had a particular look in mind I, I, I always aim to have a, a particular look in mind when I take a shot this is another one of those shots where I looked at it and I already knew what the post-process version roughly was going to look like I knew that I was going to bring out that texture I knew that I was going to try and reduce the colors because the colors are already nice and simple in there we've got a bit of blue a bit of sort of orange and a bit of green in the grass at the bottom and I was just going to try and um, actually I was going to try and emulate uh, a sort of a gritty street photography technique that I'd seen in another photographer uh, name of which escapes me just at the moment but I'll try and remember for next week um, and I already knew the technique I was going to use as well because it's something that it's a it's a fairly well known technique that uses channels and I'll show you that next week but it's it's going to be sort of a, as usual for me a higher contrast image and I'm going to do something a little bit funky with the colors so just when it comes to post processing this um, what I'm looking at is the histogram because my objective when I'm taking a photo out of uh, RAW and putting it into Photoshop is for a start to have a clear idea of what I'm trying to achieve uh, and I did know that I wanted a higher contrast um, and I wanted to, to do something a little bit gritty with it and I wanted to do um, some funky stuff with the colors but I don't want too much color in there I don't want it you know oversaturated and, and looking garish so what I'm interested in here it's it's all the tones in this there's nothing that's likely to be overexposed if I just turn on the shadows and highlights tick boxes up here you can see there is a little bit of underexposure in some of the darker areas and that's fine there's no detail there that I want you to see so I don't I don't mind that some of that shadow is blocking out there's nothing that's over bright though there's nothing really approaching over bright if you look at the histogram it all tails off you know um, one stop line is around about here so there is a little bit of data in the top stop of data but it's all pretty much in the second and third stops which is fine that's good um, so I want to spread that data out as much as I can so that when I come to work on it in Photoshop I've got as much as much breadth of data in that picture as I can as I can possibly get and I'm going to get less combing and less uh, uh, you're going to get less of those sort of stripes of color you get when you over process an image later on so I'm um, just trying to give a nice good broad amount of data in the in the raw conversion here even if that means for example it looks a little bit too bright here that's not necessarily a problem if you're going to dim it down in Photoshop just make sure that you're getting as much data out of the raw conversion into Photoshop as you can and if you do have a problem with it and if you can afford the disk space down here at the bottom which you, you can't quite see uh, let's see whether or not I can uh, I can't remember the keyboard shortcut for doing this but just off the bottom here there's this right down at the bottom the show workflow options and in the bottom there you can choose a bit depth of 16 bits per channel um, do do that if you need to um, it does take up more disk space but you're going to get much more data into Photoshop when you come to work on it so in this picture I think I'm just gonna uh, we said 59 and 66 didn't we so all I've done actually the brightness is was it 59 Some, somewhere in there um, all I've actually done is taken a bog standard um, defaults on my um, auto settings and then I've just boosted the contrast up a little bit up to 66 so all I'm doing is just sort of pre pre doing some of the extra contrast work that I'm going to do when it comes into Photoshop so I'm going to leave it there for today um, and in next week's show I will show you what I had in mind when it comes to um, doing that funky stuff with the color um, and how to go about uh, boosting the contrast all using channels in LAB mode so uh, look forward to that I will catch you next week
photo walkthrough is a weekly video podcast. You can subscribe through iTunes or by visiting www.photowalkthrough.com. Subscription is free and new shows will be automatically downloaded as soon as they're released. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, email photowalkthrough at gmail.com or leave a comment using the audio comments box on our homepage. PhotocastNetwork.com, your photography resource in the potosphere. PhotocastNetwork.com